Chemical City Double Reeds is a full-service double reed shop specializing in the sale of instruments, cane, accessories, and sheet music. Double Reed Dish listeners can enjoy free shipping with code DRDISH, all caps, no spaces. Visit them in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or online at chemicalcityreads.com. Consider buying your processed oboe and bassoon cane from those friendly folks over at Barton Cane. Processed with care and precision for your everyday reed-making needs. Take the pain and injury out of reed-making by letting Barton Cane do the hard, repetitive, boring stuff. Free up time for practicing happy hours, hikes, baking, and spending time with friends and family. Barton Cane, here for you. Visit www.bartoncane.com. Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson. And you're listening to Double Read Dish. A podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. just been griping and now it's now it's time to push record and we have to be <laughs> cheerful podcast host and not- <laughs> you're my my favorite jackie mode is grumpy jackie <laughs> i think grumpy jackie is so funny i know you do every and actually it's a common thread through all the people who are like super close to me <laughs> is the distinction between when i am ranting you find me hilarious and not exhausting. I love grumpy people. (laughs) Well, I don't know that I'm so much grumpy. It is the first week of classes. We're recording this on Friday of the first week of classes. And yes, I'm (laughs) tired. I'm exhausted. Although I have to say we're in person masked and I am so much happier Mm-hmm. than I was the entire last year and a half. Yes, same. Oh my God. Like just being with my students in the same room is <laughs> so nice. Well, I'm musically happier. I do miss like being able to just wear uh outfit mullet, business on the top. Yes. Party on the bottom, pajama pants, pants, central slippers. This is the Zoom mullet. Yeah, the Zoom mullet. I miss that (laughs) Zoom mullet, but I do enjoy (laughs) making music in person. Oh my gosh, I played in a woodwind quintet with my colleagues for the first time. Were you just, was your heart like floating out of your chest? Yes, it was so much fun. And we're playing Mislanka's second quintet. And I love the chamber music of David Mislanka. I love Mislanka. I've never gotten to play one of his woodwind quintets, any of them. Stop it. I haven't either. And so I'm like, oh, my gosh, we're like, yay. And we're playing uh, Afro-Cuban Concerto by Valerie (gasps) Coleman. And yeah, just all this rep that you can like sink your teeth into and get to know each other musically. I mean, they've all played together for like years and years and years. So they're getting to know me. You're like, Uh, hi. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, we just like read stuff and chatted and had fun. And I was just like, yay. (laughs) <laughs> I'm so excited about making music with people again that I have decided that I'm not going to solo recital this year. I'm only going to collaborate. Tell me more about that. Yeah, I'm planning on a oboe bassoon piano recital in November with mm-hmm. my colleagues, Kim Woolley and Michael Bunchman. And I'm going to work on recording, well, rehearsing for the recording of the pieces that I premiered over the summer with uh, David Walker. This time I'm going to do it uh, with Jonathan Yarrington, who has been cleared to sing again. Booyah. Booyah. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to be rehearsing and performing chamber music all year. I just could not bring myself to plan a solo recital. There's like a ton of rep that I want to play. That's like solo recital repertoire, but none of it made sense together. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to wait. Well, I'm doing two concertos this year. So it's the opposite this semester actually. So it's the opposite approach where I'm like, look at me, (laughs) but um, (laughs) 
It's my turn now. <laughs> That's uh, a pre tenure life, girl. I'm post tenure. I'm like leaning back in my chair. <laughs> Well, before I tell you more about the, that, uh, I hear the audience yelling to know what pieces you programmed for the oboe bassoon piano recital. Well, we're, we're still working on it. Mm. Um, I've been throwing pieces at them like you would not believe. What I really want to play is the Hope Trio. I love that Peter Hope I Trio. I love that piece. Uh, the Madeline Dring Trio, mm. which I am not familiar with. I've played the flute oboe piano one a few times, which I love. Everyone loves that piece. Yeah. I've never played the oboe bassoon piano one either. Yeah, this will be a first for me. Um, and I'm super interested in that Margaret Griebling High Hague piece. I don't Again, know how to pronounce her name. The audience is yelling at <laughs> how to pronounce it. I don't know either because she has a, a bassoon piece that's really popular. Maybe it's Hague. Hague. Margaret Griebling Hague. Yeah. I'm, Margaret, I'm so sorry. And I love your people music. People who know so how to say this word. So I, how many times have we been the person in the car driving and they're like, oh, that guy that Bethany was dating before Dennis. What was his oh name? Boy. What was his okay. name? And I'm like, Jason do we Bobby. really do we really have to bring housewives into it? Always. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, my colleague, Dan, who conducts the Symphonic Wind Ensemble was like, I want to have you in front of my groups. And so I'm Sweet. playing this piece called Dialogue of Self and Soul by Jim Stevenson, oh which is, yeah, a concerto for bassoon and band. I've never played it before. It's relatively new. Uh, Jeff Lyman has a fantastic recording that I've been studying. All of his recordings are fantastic. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and it's it's a really cool piece. I've never I've played concertos with band, but I don't think I've ever done a piece composed for solo bassoon and band. I've done transcriptions. Great, and that's the other one I'm doing is a transcription of Weber Hungarian with uh, the student band. Nice. Uh, so two within a month. It's, that's so I mean, much. I've played Weber Hungarian like eight hundred times, and so I'm not super stressed about that, but. As it gets closer, <laughs> uh, I feel, you know, that thing about like the put a frog in water and gradually turn up the temperature and ah! he'll, be, he'll be cooking before he notices. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I'm starting to cook, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep this animal friendly, please. Oh, yeah. This is an animal friendly podcast. This is a vegan podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy for you. I think that's going to be such a fun experience. Yeah, I am excited about it too. And actually the composer is going to be there, which is <gasps> exciting. No added pressure at all. No, we're not, not adding all. any seasoning to that pot. <laughs> I bet that our listeners are planning some really cool concerts. If you're back in person, I think most if you're in the United States, it's probably likely that you're back in person, at least masked. We want to hear about it. Send us send us an email or contact us on social media and let us know what your exciting new post quarantine. <laughs> yeah, give us rep our ideas if you can't. Yeah, see we this need your rep ideas. <laughs> um, if you have any super creative ideas, um, yeah, send those to us. I got an article idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Founded by Logan Esterling, Reed Design is pushing the boundaries of oboe and English horn reed making. They take the knowledge they've collected from hundreds of reeds and, with the power of machine learning, derive patterns and trends that accurately predict the characteristics of finished reeds while early in the sorting process. The result is quality reads with characteristics you can count on. Using their products will save you valuable time and let you get back to what you love, making music. Visit www.readdesign.io to learn more. That's R-E-E-D-E-S-I-G-N dot I-O. Specializing in the finest assortment of oboes, clarinets, bassoons, and their accessories, RDG Woodwinds serves musicians around the world. Their employees are all professional musicians who have a deep knowledge of the products that they sell. 
RDG's repair shop has an international reputation with a combined 100 plus years of service among the five repair technicians. Plain and simple, RDG provides excellent products and fabulous customer service. Visit them at rdgwoodwinds.com. They look forward to working with you. We are so lucky and happy and excited to welcome Francisco Jobert to the podcast, second bassoonist of the Louisville Orchestra. Welcome, Francisco. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here um, and talking bassoons and double reeds here. So, Yep, that's what we're here for, bassoons and double reeds. <laughs> Can you start off by telling us how you got started playing the bassoon? All right, so this is a very crazy long story, but like crazy and long. Not <laughs> um, uh, so it's it, I, I've I've actually tried to like kind of um, compress it into like a short like five second thing, but I can't. Like an elevator uh, so, pitch. Yeah, exactly. But I, it, it's just it's very hard to put it together. But basically, um, before I played bassoon, I was a, a, a trumpet player, and before that. Please don't tell anyone. Um, <laughs> I was a violin player. Ooh. Um, <laughs> Just you know, kidding, I'm I kidding. Know, I know, I feel the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was very fascinated always with finding different instruments, like exotic instruments. And I remember actually like the first time I saw the oboe and I was like, whoa, the oboe, that's such a cool instrument. Um, and there was one day I was waiting for my lesson um, and I see someone walking in the hall with this like thing in their hand and I remember it was a plastic fox bassoon I like I still have that image and I see it passing through and it was a, a bassoon but at the time I didn't know and I just stared at it and I was like what did I just witness like <laughs> what is that what is that tree yeah, that no, that no, person like, is holding? So many keys and what the heck is going on here? Um, and so I went to the internet and I remember this website. I don't know if it's still up, like Eight Notes. Like that's where you get sheet music for like random stuff. And I remember going to that website because like after that, I didn't know for a while. Um, and it wasn't until I went out to search for some sheet music that I went to this website and they it had like a pictures of all the instrument like classical instruments. And I remember seeing the bell uh, of the bassoon and then it, it had a picture of the bell and it said bassoon. And I was like, oh, that's a bassoon. And then I went on a rabbit hole, uh, a rabbit hole on, on the internet searching what the heck is a bassoon. <laughs> and I, I really went full nerd, like, full nerd i like i went all articles i read like reads i it just crazy i was really obsessed i i don't know why just i was so obsessed with this and then i saw the fingering charts and i just saw the how to play low b flat and i was like this is the most complicated thing i've ever seen <laughs> i really want to play this um and from there on that's where i got to the bassoon but it got to the point that it was so crazy that I made because my dad wouldn't buy me one. And I was so sad because he was like, well, you're doing well in the trumpet. And they, this is a one time thing. It will pass. But I was so upset that I even took a PVC pipe that was laying around the house. And I actually took a Sharpie and drew all the <laughs> And I'm not kidding. I, I, so I wish cute. I was making this up. And and then I started like, that's how I learned like the chromatic. I was like, just kind of, I, of course, they, they weren't perfect. Like, I couldn't just, and it didn't play anything. But that's how crazy I was with obsessed with starting the bassoon. That is amazing. Yeah, I was, Do you I still was have your sophomore. Sharpie PVC pipe bassoon? I, I don't because they threw uh... it away. They threw it away because it was just taking space and it was just... <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah but actually it's funny because uh, at New World I had to do this profile video and I actually made another one just for the oh! sake of making the video. Oh. Um and the video is somewhere out there um on my profile video. Oh but, my god yeah. that's amazing. 
that's how I, I got started in bassoon. There you go. So talk to us about when you started to learn the bassoon, did you immediately know that you were going to be serious and pursue a career in it? Or um, maybe just talk us through your training and educational journey and embarking as a, a serious player, quote unquote. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And yeah, totally. Like once I got the bassoon, my dad, I can finally convince my dad to buy one. Uh, a very cheap one from eBay, but it worked, I guess. Um, yeah, so after that, that's when I actually started thinking about this as a profession. Because before that, I was, you know, I was decent at the trumpet. But I was like, well, this is not what I want to do for, for my life, like for life, um, or as a career. And it wasn't until I got the bassoon that I... I got that that was just solid I, I was like i really want to make this my career and it started because i was the only bassoonist in the in the, the school in the whole school because remember it, in some context in puerto rico there are only like six bassoonists total and i probably know them all so um that meant that all, i was playing in every ensemble in the whole school everyone was like oh you played you're the one who plays the bassoon like i want you in my ensemble oh you're the one who plays bassoon and then that kind of pushed me not only into learning the bassoon faster because i was like oh god i need to catch up mm -hmm. uh, but also it meant that i was I, I felt like i was doing something important and all those teachers that encouraged me to keep playing their ensemble ensembles and all that that it's funny because i was there was a point where i was playing trumpet and bassoon in the same school and because my trumpet uh teacher was like no he has to play trumpet <laughs> if he actually wants to take bassoon because i will not allow that <laughs> and, and so <laughs> and so you know i was playing both but we all knew that and all the teachers knew that bassoon was the most important one i can just uh, imagine like i'm imagining you like walking around with like a frowny face over your head when you have a trumpet <laughs> and a happy face when you have your bassoon oh uh, yeah it, it is funny because um you know i was playing trump and all that and it, this was the intermediate band i think and the teach the conductor there was like next week just bring the bassoon <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, okay, <laughs> I guess I'll do that. Um, and so, yeah, after that, I was like sold, sold in bassoon. And, and now it's been a, a whole journey. I did my undergrad uh, in Puerto Rico, where I'm from, uh, the Conservatory of Music uh, with Adam, Adam Havrilla, who's a student of Frank and Nancy, Nancy Gores and Frank Morelli. Um, and then I went to Yale uh where i did my masters and uh then i went to new world uh and now i'm here <laughs> so simple <laughs> <laughs> well i mean it's been let's let's get a little deeper on it um because i guess uh my undergrad you know the whole four years it was funny because living in the island you, it, it, it was kind of on a bubble i was kind of in a bubble i didn't know what was out there i i only went to a, a few summer festivals uh in my first two years then i went to kind of know what was out there in my third year i think 2013 uh to know what, what was out there and then i was like okay so i'm finishing my undergrad and there there was the the, the common knowledge of like okay if you finish your undergrad you have to do a master's if not you're not serious in music this was the the thought back then so so i was like okay well where am i gonna go for a master's that, that was a real question and i met this flute player uh in puerto rico she's still there actually she's um in the orchestra now it's part of the orchestra uh but she once approached me because she went to yale and she was like you know, I think you should go to Yale. Like, you should audition to Yale. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, it's Yale. Like, you just, just search for like, what is that? 
And I, I honestly had no idea what Yale entailed. You're like, like, what's a Yale? Yeah, like, what's a Yale? Like, what is that? Like, is that like a summer camp? Like, where, where is this? Um, so, so yeah, so then I researched and then it was Frank Morelli and it was great because uh, my teacher already knew Frank Morelli and his style of teaching. Okay. And so then Frank Morelli came for a master class my senior year. And it was great because then I, ha I could play for him. He uh, heard me. Uh, also, we had a lesson. I liked uh, studying with him. And so then I, I, I um, applied for Yale and, and, and got it. But I also applied to U of um, University of Miami, um, and and it was funny because um, I really was kind of at that point I was really into like audio engineering and all that, and the University of Miami has a great program of that, uh, and so I was like, well, I'm I could study bassoon and do a side on audio engineering and all that. But then once, you know, but and this was with uh, Gabriel Beavers. Uh, but then I got accepted too at Yale. And then I was like, oh, God, well, <laughs> you know, but it was a, it was a really hard. It was a really hard um, decision, believe it or not, for me. Mm -hmm. It was because I was so tied to like it, it was the perfect combination. But then I was like, you know, just give it a try. Go to Yale. Uh, you're gonna study with Frank, Frank Riley, um, and, and then if you if you're still interested, uh, and also I love how like how Gabriel Beavers, uh, huge shout out to Gabriel Beavers because we're still friends and and we still um, you know are in touch, and he's a great teacher and all that. Uh, so it's not to say anything about his teaching or teaching or anything. Um, but then I was like, okay, so just go to Yale, and if you're done with it and you still want to pursue that, then just go to do a a, a DMA or something, uh, um, U of mm -hmm. UM. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just gave that a try, and and that's what worked. And and then after Yale, I could have gone to do my DMA, but then I got to New World, and it was like, well, I'll already you be. You got in Miami. back to Miami. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, that's how, how that's how, how that happened. Um, I'm fascinated to hear about your interest in audio recording because you founded VG Bassoonist, which yes. is a wildly successful YouTube channel. And it seems like you found a way to merge those interests in bassoon and recording and audio engineering and video. And I'd like to hear more about that and how, and maybe you can even expand into, um, your ideas on what our uh, podcast colleague Garrett McQueen calls so-called classical music yes. and uh, how that fits into your worldview. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think VG Bassoonis was the, the child of my classical ambitions of, you know, being the rigid classical player and also kind of the the real kind of chill like look I'm a, I'm a gaming chair come on guys like he's relaxing y'all he's, he's taking relaxed. this too serious <laughs> and so and so it was kind of the balance to kind of like it was my way i guess to balance that um pressure of that we always feel in the classical field with something that i could just do for fun and and just experiment honestly because i think that's a thing that we are not always given the chance to do much um, in classical music, unfortunately. Not in the terms of interpretation, uh, but even then sometimes. Uh, but like, well, yeah, and also the striving for perfection at all times. Right, right, and and also the programming of it. Mm -hmm. You know, like we are usually just we have a set already done and we just play it. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, it was the the moment to just get away from all that. And just okay, I love the soundtrack. What can we do with it? Um, and also, since I love uh, recording and all that so much, it was a way to not only learn more about the whole recording thing, but also to 
get better at it because I was actually doing it. Because it's not the same to watch YouTube tutorials all day, <laughs> not do anything. <laughs> uh, and actually just sitting down and being like, okay, what was it? How do you re press record? Where is the key? You know, it, it's very different. Um, and it was a good place to like kind of experiment with that and then learning like EQ, like what does that even mean? Um, and then, you know, I'll, I play, I'll play something, oh, this sounds bad and try to figure out with that. And it, it was a good uh, experimentation and just getting me off from that, um, you know, constant like you have to do this and you can drive yourself uh, crazy. Yeah and, yeah. and that was my balance. Um, and I'm glad I started it. I actually started it because I got into this group about entrepreneurship at Yale and we will always meet and talk about ways to do different things. Uh, shout outs to Astrid, Astrid Baumgart. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And she uh, she was always like encouraging us to do the things that we had in our minds, and one of those things was that just recording something. and And I remember, uh, I think it was Mario Kart. I was playing it, and there was this really cool saxophone solo solo. And I was like, I wonder, like it's hard, but I mean, I'm a classical player. I I think I can play this, and so. I transcribed it and then I started playing it and that video actually blew up cool YouTube, which is kind of weird how things work the, the one the, it's funny the, the videos that I've actually put the effort on they just you know, they're okay <laughs> but then the ones that I really had no care for the world because I was literally just putting a recording on front of my desk and just playing that transcription and that video just blew up uh, but anyway it started like that. It started from that um, experimentation kind of phase. And it goes to now that I'm more of a professional kind of like I made my living out of playing and all that. Um, I think it's something that I, I, I would tell everyone is that, you know, don't. Sure, like we have to do, you know, if you're going to audition or if you're going to follow a, a, an orchestral career, uh, yes, you have to go a little bit on the grind. Um, you have to play your excerpts. You have to get, you know, your scales, all that. Um, but don't limit yourself to only one thing. Uh, it You don't have to in terms of like do whatever like gives you joy because that i think that's what's gonna like eventually uh, uh just gonna open up some doors to, like there's always people wanting to hear your product if it's unique enough i don't care that's why i don't care about playing the homo as a soloist i don't care about that because I, I know there is a thousand people i have played it there's a thousand interpretations of it. It doesn't mean I hate the Hummel. It's just I don't have any um, interest in grinding it uh, mm -hmm. for that reason. I'd rather do a concert that speaks for me. And for you, I and, and also for you classic, uh, super classic people, that doesn't mean you should get away from the Hummel. If you feel like you're really passionate about playing the Hummel, Go for it because it's a, it's a very cool piece. I love it. It's very showy, uh, and it will show how you know such a good player you are. But it, it's different for everyone, and I think we only have. It seems like we only have a cookie cutter, a cookie cutter for like extreme classical people. We don't have enough different shapes for like all oh, those other people who are interested in doing other other things that don't have to be a an orchestral career um and i guess it's easy to say the in my case because i have an orchestral job but that doesn't mean that you know i i've shied away from that part of myself which is vg business i've done some cringy cringy stuff there like <laughs> seriously cringy that sometimes i'm afraid that people will not take me seriously but it's okay if that happens it's okay i don't care um 
but 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 yeah that's that's i guess that's uh to the point of of really just do whatever you feel passionate about and you know of course you have to sustain yourself and if it if, if it's an uh orchestral job or uh chamber music or uh a podcast whatever it is just just go for it just just do it do be passionate about it um i love that i couldn't agree more yeah and i wouldn't say cringy but i love how in your stuff you will invite humor into mm -hmm. the creative process and that that is really humanizing and i think one of the things you're getting at is that of course there are standards or the grind as you said that come along with pursuing um especially in orchestral playing you know a field with more supply than demand and that you have to take that seriously but the the fact that that equals perfection and it that can be really dehumanizing and often we get into music for the expression and the things that it makes us feel and the joy that it gives us and so bringing us back to joy i think is a really important part of sustaining an entire career because as i get further into my 30s i'm starting to see people burn out and elect mm -hmm. to leave the f this week alone on my social media field i've seen two people mm -hmm. paying their mortgage with classical music who have elected to leave because it's just not sustainable anymore mm -hmm. um so one thing i'd love to you know kind of piggyback on that is also in your channel you invite genres that are not classical like you referenced mario kart um you also had the giant steps project i know and so i'd love to hear you talk about um interacting and welcoming other genres into your bassoon playing as well yeah totally uh yeah it's 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 a huge part of the channel and again it goes to my whole um reasoning of why i don't i just want to do things that give honestly it, it's someone said it to me once it was like i was taking my channel more of a of an in an evangelical kind of way not in a religious sense but more of like setting kind of like op opening ways to people to understand that the bassoon is not only to play on like the sorcerer's apprentice or the rite of spring mm -hmm. or bolero it's like you can play literally whatever you want and you can on this instrument uh and for me that is so important because i for so long i was so boxed in that that you know we only play mill days and and weisenborns um and we only play hummels and vabers and you know like i wouldn't ever think about bringing my teacher giant steps like he would be like what, what are you doing <laughs> but I, I i hope that um it changes uh, over time that if if i have a student that brings i don't know some transcription okay let's work on this work on making it work on the bassoon you know like what are the nuances because in the end it, it, we're doing music it's 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 i know it's we have a bassoon teacher a bassoon that gets us to knows the instrument well but i feel like in the end what we actually want to do is music so i i'm very open to all sorts of music and it could be rock i've actually done rock too in one of those videos um and i just want to just make just make it work it's not really if, if it's appropriate or not it's just like okay let me see okay i want to play rock on the bassoon that's a very distinct sound so i need something crunchy okay i need a pickup uh i need some effects uh you know and you start thinking cre creatively and you're not just stuck in like well the bassoon cannot do that so i will mm -hmm. not do that uh i just try to find the ways to make that work and I, for me that's what ex that's what's exciting about playing anything it's just figuring it out how to deliver it how I want to. And yeah, also, it's very important to put out the, the jazz stuff because bassoon and jazz, it's not always, especially in the, in the bigger scale, it's not as recognized, unfortunately. For me, one of the idols in bassoon is Paul Hansen. And Paul Hansen is a god 
one of the gods in jazz and the bassoon. It, it it's uh it, just because it's not being play like bassoon is not being played classical is this doesn't mean it's wrong and and I think that's what I really want to get across uh on my channel and ultimately the whole thing about uh the especially now with the whole thing about race and all that I think jazz is a very black genre mm -hmm. and I feel this is a way to kind of open up to different types of um interpretations and and just viewing of music in general you know challenging the idea of a classical supremacy yeah exactly exactly mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. because uh, i mean coming from puerto rico you 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 know i grew up listening to like salsa and and, and like mm -hmm. actually my grandfather used to be a salsa player so in my veins that's 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 the thick of it um and then when i started the bassoon of course then i got to know the classicals um but i was always nobody told me like oh you should only listen to like pop you know or like salsa don't listen to classical that was never the case uh so i it, for me it was all it was just a different shade of color um but but I feel like it's not the same where it's the, when it's the opposite. It's like oh you don't don't get there. Like that's just nasty. Like look look at the articulation they're doing. Oh and the oh, just, oh, the sound. Oh don't do that. Mm -hmm. It's like you you start like limiting yourself in how you hear interpretations, and I think that just hinders creativity honestly. Because yeah. then you play a certain piece of music and then you just limit yourself to like five different articulations or two different sounds um so that's just my way of seeing this and how it all connects to vg bassoonist mm -hmm. yeah no i totally agree it seems like this exploration of other genres um and engaging your creative mind sort of releases the pressure for you as a classical bassoonist can you tell us more about um Maybe, maybe this is not an answerable question, but is there crossover in how you approach your uh, creativity in arranging and transcribing and how you play second bassoon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. I guess some of the things, because I, I like always being aware of things and how I could use, because I like to do a lot of things. I, I like to do... I one of my problems is that i like to learn about everything um it's it can be a good problem i was uh, gonna say is that a problem <laughs> uh, I know, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, the problem is that then focusing so that's uh, i guess that's where the problem begins but i always in order to not hinder that side of me i like to see how things relate to each other um and one of the things i've kind of uh, figured out that works great and and this is one of the reasons i keep doing these videos is that these videos usually challenge me in a certain way that i rather tackle than just doing i don't know the the arben's double tonguing studies you know like it mm. i if i want to work on double tonguing i'm like okay what soundtrack i love that has double tonguing okay this one oh i love that and then I'll just write it down so that then I have to like work out that part of working in. And the same thing happens with, uh, you know, if I want something that's low and soft, then I will try to do an arrangement that covers that. And I think it goes to the playing as a second bassoonist. Also, it's very good uh, doing these arrangements and playing with myself in terms of that. I, I like when I'm playing with myself, you still have to tune. Um, you know, it's not like, and it's not like I'm using Melodyne or anything like that. It like has to be in tune. So I always, you know, it's always a challenge and, and kind of always hearing what the lead voice is doing and okay, I'm the second voice or third or fourth, whatever I'm doing. How can I just sip in and blend to the sound? And I think that it's always, you know, it's a it's a thing about chamber music. And I think, you know, when people think about first or second bassoon and all that, 
I don't know. I feel like that's too complicated. I I always dilute dilute. Is that the word? Yeah, dilute everything to like chamber music, even orchestra. If you're playing in an orchestra, you're just playing chamber music in a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. If you're playing uh, second bassoon, you're you could see in a micro world that you're playing chamber music with either the first bassoonist or the whole woodwind quintet uh, quartet or session or with the whole orchestra and you kind of choose and pick like who are you doing it with but it's always kind of i'm always thinking about chamber music and this is from playing in a quintet for a few years in uh in my undergrad and you know having a good time and learning a lot with a lot of mistakes but you know that's how you learn so mm -hmm. Yeah. Is is that chamber music mindset something that you've in the orchestral setting developed on the job, or is that something that you brought with you into your audition preparation process? And do you account any of that mindset for your success in auditioning? Well, I always, I think since undergrad, because fortunately I got invited to be in this quintet, the Safra quintet. Uh, when I started like um, my undergrad like my first year they were like we need bassoonists come in uh, and they were like third years and, and you know seniors so they knew what they were doing I had no idea so they kind of shaped me kind of like think like think this way and like you should play less you should play more now blend with the horn but and so all this kind of like was brewing already it was like kind of um simmering since since my undergrad of course it has evolved through the years um but it's always a thing that i i, I have on my the back of my mind however uh it's very important um uh, when auditioning to understand that people will hear you as part of the ensemble usually uh, especially second bassoon excerpts. I mean, they are so random. Um, and so if you just play them like you're playing like a first bassoon audition, you're it, you're just going to blow it because you're going to play like out there, you, you know, you just want to balls to the wall. Um, <laughs> when, you know, sometimes you just have to slow down, chill, listen to what's happening. A great example of this is Brown's Violin Concerto, which mm -hmm. will be asked in every single second person audition out there um and it's it's one of those that you have to think about the oboe if you're not thinking about the oboe you need to go back to the drawing board <laughs> uh, <laughs> because it, it's it's very it's very straightforward i mean you're just playing because you know you, you have all these things, and I call this the micros, um, thinking about like, okay, I, I need to play soft. I need to play in tune, make sure the fifths and thirds are in tune, um, where to breathe, all that. I, I know there's a thousand things that are happening, but I, I call those the micros because they don't matter in the bigger picture. The bigger picture is you're being an accompanist to the oboe. And if that mission is not achieved, doesn't matter how good the mi the micros are, you're not doing the, the the work. You're not you're not doing the mission. Um, and so that's I think that's where people can get too much into the technicality of, of things um, and forget the music the musical part of of auditioning. I love that, um, especially because when we're learning the oboe Brahms violin concerto excerpt, we're always like, if you're not listening to the second bassoon, you got to go back to the drawing board. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yeah, but you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's because I feel like the, the oboist is there in the panel, you know, and the problem, and I'm not going to, uh, blame you, Galit, about this. Um, but you know, you guys take it too damn slow. <laughs> and 
I know you guys have way less resistance, but we're down there. Um, and it's soft. But this is still... a really good tip, by the way. If you want to get this, if you're doing an oboe audition, you want to get the second bassoonist on your side, take that bronze violin fast. A little faster. I know, a little faster. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> the second bassoon will love it. Um, <laughs> And just play a, very loud, very loud. Loud and, loud. <laughs> loud and fast. <laughs> pro tips. These are the pro tips. There you go. You, you heard it here, folks. <laughs> this is the hot take. The hot take here. <laughs> this is how you win auditions. Yeah. Fast and loud. Uh, but yeah, so it's one of those things that, um, yeah, it's very hard to do an audition and i think that's that's the that was the hardest excerpt um that i had to play in in second bassoon auditions what is your dream program if you mm. got to choose between any piece from any genre what's your dream program to play wow. that's a lot but i will say that i did a concert at new world that i programmed and did the whole thing and it was about danzas, bomba, and, and plena, which is our like folk music in Puerto Rico. And they are, what's kind of cool about it is that they cover like the European part, which is danza, it's very classical kind of structured. And then you have bomba, which is all African, you know, drums and stuff. And then you have the plena, which is kind of like a, a middle of, of both. Um, and I love that so much, just making that concert happen. And there was not a single Mozart, Mozart or Bach in it. It was just folk music. People loved it. I loved it. I had a great time. I wish I could do it again. I think that's that's what I would like to do next. I, I would like to do that concert again. Yeah. We'll be there. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> as you're speaking this kind of circles back a little bit but as you're speaking about your creativity and desire to be adventurous and multifaceted in your performing i wondered if that manifested itself in your approach to read making mm -hmm. um and if any of that curiosity seeps in there can you talk to us about your approach as a read maker a little bit yeah, <laughs> well, I guess this applies. And the first thing that I thought is that there was one time I was like, you know, like reeds are made out of uh, fibers and they have water. I wonder what would happen if you put a reed in an oven. <laughs> and so <laughs> I put a reed in, in, in the oven and then I tried it and I ruined it i i mean you it baked just, it i baked it i literally <laughs> I, I baked arundo don't axe uh that's a new recipe it doesn't work to play but did I you guess, season it <laughs> i mean that's the only thing that was missing just, <laughs> maybe that's why it didn't work i didn't <laughs> it needed more salt it needed more yeah i needed more uh, olive oil of the, yeah, yeah, it needed um to to balance it out. I think it was it needed more acids. <laughs> acid from it. Um. So so yeah. So I you know destroyed reeds. I've I've done all sorts of things, and it's all in the sake of think, like just you know nobody can tell me like that works or that doesn't work. I literally tried it. It doesn't work. Um, <laughs> did it well. I haven't tried it seasoned, so maybe if you tell me, well, if you bake it and season it well, it will work. What about then pan I fry? I could be like, well, I could give it a try. <laughs> but, but just baking it, it doesn't work. So <laughs> nobody can convince me of that. <laughs> and so, yeah, so that's one of those things that I, I've done. And I experiment a lot. I Now I have a set style. And... Usually I do reads depending on uh, what I'm doing. I actually, let's see, let me think about this because it's, tr it's a tricky question. I I like doing my reads. I try to do everything, but 
if it's a special thing like playing a soloist or chamber music or I don't know something that I really need to be really soft then I'll do a read for that but for the most part I just like to have a all-around read mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah but the creative part is always there like mm -hmm. try to you know if things are not working well what can I lose like before I throw it out like I might as well just really ruin it like mm -hmm. until it doesn't even want to vibrate mm -hmm. um and then i just throw it out because that gives me data that i didn't have before mm -hmm. have you tried freezing it i have not he knows what he's doing tonight though we may have stumbled upon something life-changing we don't know i don't know i mean it could be we could be at the brink of uh <laughs> A new discovery, and that's how... We'll get how... the Nobel Prize. I'll split it with I you. I know. That's how we were supposed to make reads all the time, and <laughs> we haven't you know, known it yet. <laughs> Would you share with us a favorite memory of a past performance? This is not... It, this is more just how funny it was, more than anything else. I know it's braggy, but it was performing for John Williams. I was playing the... Cool. It was like a gala. And I was performing for John Williams. And he was literally like six feet apart before it was cool. Um, and I just remember just going out and being like, just don't look at him. Just don't, just don't look <laughs> at him. Uh, because I was, I was playing the Sacred Trees, uh, uh -huh. one movie of those. And, you know, it was a gala for him. Like, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't just blow it in his face. Yeah, just, and so... I was just like, just whatever you do, just don't look at him. Just keep look at everyone else. Just don't look at him. And to this day, I never looked at him. You like, don't know what, what he looks like. like. I don't know. Like, <laughs> after I played the whole thing, then I addressed him. But before that, I had no idea. Like That's amazing. Even if he was there. Because I, if I looked at him, I would have freaked out. and. <laughs> destroy the whole performance that is so cool that's a very cool brag <laughs> yeah i'm very fortunate to have that happen but yeah yeah but we can't have only bragging so we would also love to hear yes. if anything in performance has been embarrassing or funny or oh my gosh you will never believe this thing that happened to me once do you have any fun oh, yeah, stories yeah, like yeah, that yeah, yeah. and that's why i actually started with the john williams so that it could balance <laughs> out so that it balances out and then yeah. we could like my my ego stays in check like it, it stays you tame, you know um so <laughs> this memory was so embarrassing but it, it was so funny. Now, in hindsight, I was destroyed. But in hindsight, it's super, it's super funny. Because when I was playing for this quintet, um, that was my senior year uh, of undergrad. And so I already had received the letter that I was going to Yale the next year. Or that same year, I think. Um, and so <laughs> we, were playing the, we were playing the Barber quintet. And so before we started playing the barber, they wanted to acknowledge that I got to Yale. And they were like, hey, like, you know, Francisco, like next year is going to Yale and whatever Yale is and blah, all the fanfare. <laughs> and then I blew up the beginning. <laughs> like, like I'm... You know when you get that um, the donkey noise uh, on the on the when you have the speaker keys like you know like it just sounds really really bad. That just happened. I played the 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 first A uh, was it G sharp, and when I went to the C, it didn't come out. It just cracked. You know though it's it was really bad. It was very embarrassing. And the most hilarious part is that literally starting the piece. Like, that's how we started. That's how we started right after this guy is the guy that's going to Yale, actually. So, <laughs> so that, that's something. <laughs> did you, so did you end up looking at any of your quintet mates while that was happening? No, 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 no. I, I just, just 
Just, Sarah, the you know, music. bury <laughs> yourself since we don't have a since we don't have earth to bury our heads. <laughs> well, at least in the stand, you know, just like I don't think all the cues, all you know that that piece is very like everyone has to look at each other just to get back. I I don't think I even I just, just like <laughs> cannot see anyone. I'll just play from here. <laughs> Did you? You just send Yale back your acceptance letter. Like... <laughs> Pretty much. I was, I was like, are you guys sure? Like, I, I mean, still have time. We still have time. <laughs> uh, that, that's know, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, that that's incredible. Our <laughs> our favorite question to close with and you've been so generous with your time we don't want to take too much of it is what advice would you give to a younger person who aspires to have a career like yours well first of all self-care just be very aware of like your needs in terms of of mentally and physically too because we do a lot of physical things, um, but I will also warn you, or or kind of um, just so that you're aware that sometimes, how can I explain this without being too controversial? You know, a lot of what we do, especially when we have to audition and considering the pool and the amount of of jobs out there if you want to go into a, an orchestral job is that you know you have to think you have to practice as if your life depended on it but you have to perform as if you had a million chances to do it um, meaning that you have to be prepared really prepared because remember that there's people that are going to be competing against you just doing the same thing. Um, and if they apply more time or more knowledge on it, they'll have an advantage on you, most likely. Um, however, I think where most people crack on auditions is in their mind. Um, once you start thinking about the car you're going to buy once you get this job, you're most likely have lost the game already. Um, you have to stay in the game. Like it's like, okay, well, I'm just gonna perform today. Like if, the, if there's nobody, but you're just performing it as beautifully as you can for yourself. If you start thinking about the panel, about what they're gonna th say, about all these crazy details, you're gonna get you're gonna get in your head, and that's not how you make music. You don't play the most lovely melody by thinking about like, you know, my like my life is, you know, you're not like being ha hung on, on like a volcano and if you miss a note, you get dropped. Mm -hmm. So you have to think about like the, the, the easiest, most chill moment on the spot to perform. But also you have to prepare as if you were hanging on that volcano mm -hmm. because that's that's my way to kind of like balance things out and not lose my mind. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that made any sense, it but really that's does. how I uh, that's how I approach uh, auditioning and just doing the whole thing. Uh, and, and also don't don't set your value as a human on auditions or if you're successful at auditions or at summer festivals or at going to schools if you really love what you're doing you're gonna keep doing it um it's it you're gonna learn and you're eventually you know learn from that um you know i've I, i've known so many so many talented musicians that have that still don't have an orchestral job and or that have been delayed into getting that orchestral job and when they tell me oh i didn't pass it i don't think any less of them you know they they're still the person they are um and also 
if you don't want to pursue a, a orchestral career, that's totally fine because you're you should be respected for the craft you do, not for like the accolades or whatever you have. You might have like, you know, I got I what. I was accepted to Yale and I still blew it on the barber. You know, <laughs> that'll happen. You know, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it, so the, the same can happen the other way too. So. <laughs> I'm just saying, uh, just really think about the why you do the things you do and just do it because you love and you love doing them and because you want to. So that, that should be my, my, my advice. Francisco, this has been the most fun. Thank you <laughs> so much for joining us on the podcast. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here and, um, you know, sharing all those shame, really shameful moments. And, <laughs> but of course, don't do not forget that I play for John Williams and I didn't blow it there. So <laughs> just the record that, shall that thus. <laughs> To balance things out here, guys, okay? <laughs> <laughs>all oh, right here we go follow us on social media you know the trail who's coming up on the next <laughs> episode glee next we have ryan roberts oboe and english horn of the new york philharmonic jackie and this nerd parade now go make reads